Hi, it's Jason Heath from Eastman Strings, and we are talking today with Jonathan Glaive, who is the orchestra director at Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Jonathan does so many things in the music world, and he's always adapting to new circumstances. So during the pandemic, I thought it would be a great time to sit down and learn about how he's teaching in the current moment, what he's been up to, and to congratulate him on winning 2021 Teacher of the Year Award from the Michigan chapter of the American String Teachers Association. We've got links to everything in the description below, and let's dive into our conversation with Jonathan. I think this is a huge question, but what's the last year been like, Jonathan? Well, let's see, where to begin? I had a lot of mixed emotions and mixed um, feelings about it all. Generally speaking, you know, I'm a champion for education, and I think, like, if you're presented with a challenge, it's kind of our duty to rise to it and do everything we can to make it work and be optimistic about it. That said, something very new that affects people, not just in their work lives, but their home lives. And, you know, if you think about the, the larger picture surrounding just being an educator right now, you know, the amount of parents that are having to work from home and students that are, you know, struggling with uh, depression and they're struggling with all sorts of things that, they um, maybe had were working through before, but now it's just kind of blown up. You know, it's a uh, it's a lot to take in, and you think about just the mechanism of what a school does for a community. You know, we have lunch programs, we have opportunities for people to feel safe and connected. It's um, it's just a place to be. You know, it's that's so important, and we take that very seriously. And it's hard as an educator when. You're kind of used to knowing that for one hour a day, those students are in your room and you can take care of them and help make sure they're safe, happy, healthy, and being musically enriched. It's been challenging. Um, me personally, you know, I have three children under the age of three and, you know, I'm trying to teach from home. You know, it's very difficult to get childcare right now because of the situation. So, you know, occasionally I have a child sitting on my lap while I'm teaching scales and that's just how it goes, mm -hmm. but we rise to the occasion. And um, I, I think that's that's the big thing. You know, I've early on, I, my main focus was make sure our students stay connected. We communicate, we reach out to each other. Communication is the biggest element here. That was my main focus early on when we didn't really uh, have an idea of how curriculum should go in this environment. And then this past fall, when we went all virtual, I kind of shifted things. I said, well, we really need to build more skill here. Um, but still take care of community. And so my entire focus has been trying to do that. I mention you all the time uh, as, as somebody who I think is just, you know, has a, what, what one would call a high performing program by any metric, you know, name the accolade, you've got it. But, but getting to know you, there's so much more to you as a teacher. And I remember chatting with you four years ago, maybe as your group was preparing for Midwest, which mm -hmm. was uh, happening, I believe 2018, if I'm remembering right. Yeah. Uh, and and you had I, w I wouldn't say Michigan. actually 2017 maybe but that's 2017 okay, okay. so uh, a, a few years ago and 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 just the I don't want to say mixed emotions but like for for many directors and my group played in 2015 you know that's like that's like the winning the Super Bowl right for for an orchestra teacher but there's so much more to being an educator than just getting the ribbon or getting the trophy or getting the accolade or, get, or you know and that sort of thing and and I just it, it really sort of hit home from for me talking to you a few years ago how much how much more there is to that and i guess this moment right now when we're not playing at midwest or anywhere or in our hall or leaving our house you know i guess it's been an opportunity and i imagine for you to to explore other things that maybe you know in any more standard given year you wouldn't be doing like like what what have you been doing with your students this is another gigantic and challenging question but okay so i've been trying in my what 13 14 years here i don't even remember um, i've been trying to highlight three things okay musicianship citizenship and friendship if we work on those three things we're doing our job as a community so when the shutdown originally happened it was all to me about citizenship and friendship trying to find ways to connect in any way, you know? So I put out assignments that were kind of vague. They were like, okay, perform uh, FaceTime with the grandparents and play their favorite song. Go stand on your porch and put a concert on for your mailman. Record playing a lullaby as somebody fell asleep in your house. Using music as a tool for good and using music to kind of keep people's spirits up. Mm -hmm. And that worked really well for a lot of people. Some of my students were like, yeah, I'm not really into that. 
you know, but th the majority of them really kind of went after that idea. Starting the foundation there and not really working on skill building necessarily with technique, I think was a good thing, a very, very good thing, because it just kind of got students thinking about ways in which you can use music in a new way. So at the end of last year, was I doing a lot of skill building? Absolutely not. I didn't think that was the priority. It was mostly just about community and connecting. I think from there, you know, I went into the fall thinking, okay, I got to bring back more musicianship stuff because I have students that are hungry for that. You know, in a program like mine, you know, they, they, they need that enrichment. So I brought in um, elements of that more. I started rethinking about what curriculum is possible. I didn't think about what we didn't have. I tried to think about what could be. Hopefully you give me a chance to talk about Upbeat Music App a little later. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I started putting together assignments that were all about that, you know, um, having mentorship programs that were both musical and non-musical uh, activities. Um, I put a camp on where we had a nice campfire virtually and some people played for each other. And Jason, I gotta tell you the best part of this is some of those students in person um, are so quiet and they don't reach out to you and they don't communicate with anybody, but if they get a chance to text a mentor that's an upperclassman or get a chance to just write you a private message in a chat saying hello, there are people that almost never spoke before the pandemic started that are now coming out of their shell. So it's so easy to talk about students who are not thriving right now, but there are a few that are and that have really bought into this. Bottom line is I'm now mixing all of these things together, musicianship, citizenship, and friendship, and we're doing the best we can. It's not perfect, right. but it's definitely developed. I am now, what, five years out of the classroom, at least maybe somewhere, somewhere around there. And it's amazing how quickly things change. I like to think that I know what's up. And then I chat with some of my old colleagues and they're talking about all these apps and different ways. I, I, I you know, I, it's totally foreign to me. So uh, Upbeat, maybe we can talk about that now. What, what, sure. what tell, tell me about, about that. I, that's something that's new to me. Okay. So I think it was like June or so I was, uh, I was online and I was just looking around for, things that maybe we could use in the classroom to keep us as an ensemble in some way, knowing that we can never fully replicate the experience. You know, at the end of the day, they signed up for orchestra, right? So that comes with mostly the social stuff mm -hmm. and some music in between. Anyway, so Upbeat Music, I, I came across it from the moment I had a demo. I, uh, I was hooked and I looked at this and I said, it was very bare bones technology. You know, it was a place where you could go in a room like Zoom and you could record and then it would just like line it up for you and then it create an MP4 that you download and you have a product. And I was like, this is intriguing. You know, I was, I was thinking about the other apps that do this. And so I, I took that app and I started running with it and I'd like contact friends around the country and I'd say, can you try this thing called Upbeat Music App with me? And we do it and then we talk about education. And, and then I just started texting the founders like nonstop like every day with really annoying questions like, hey, uh, does this connect to a school G platform? Does this, uh, is there a way for me to download like a roster of everybody that performed? Um, what, what can happen? Just like annoying questions, like super annoying questions, at least what I thought were annoying. They responded to every single one and almost within an hour. And I was like, these guys are onto something and they were open to the idea of making this an educational tool. I don't think that was originally their thought. But now it's with me kind of bugging them about education, saying like, look, this is a classroom tool that's missing right now. Um, there are other things similar, and I don't want to discredit those. But the whole idea of human connection and trying to create an ensemble product that's easy for the teacher that's not skilled in technology, this is the win. So um, over the course of the summer, I spent, I am not, I'm not ashamed to admit it, you know, probably 50 plus hours, you know, just exploring the application and its extent to its extent, you know, as far as I can, um, reaching out to members all across the country and saying, let's try this thing. Anyway, bottom line is it came into the fall and they were talking about releasing an education version of this or kind of a way to reach out to educators. And so I, I kind of started advising the guys on how to do that. And then I negotiated like a big contract with our district for something like, um, I don't know, 8,000 accounts. We got it approved through the school board, which is amazing. And we've gone forward from there. And now I believe they're in, um, I think they said 70 countries. They have, you know, 20,000 accounts and it's just kind of boomed. And I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've received emails saying like, 
look, are you really, is this thing really work for you? I'm like, yes. I, I don't jump on board trains like this unless I think it's actually a great product. Everybody, when this shutdown happened, I think had one thing that they needed to contribute mm -hmm. to make education better. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter how big or small it is. And I chose to focus on this and I'm so glad I did because it's changed my teaching and changed how I think about technology. Wow. Well, that is a high endorsement and you have given me something to dig into <laughs> after we get off of this call. I, I've, I've also been known to pester founders uh, on apps I'm passionate about. I've got this practicing app that I, dis I discovered that the founder was based on my street in San Francisco, like just a couple blocks south. So we've become friends and it's, it's been really interesting. Yeah. But, but um, okay, that is, that is very cool. Wow. Okay. Okay. It's amazing what, what, um, when those things align, when you but when one person gets passionate about something and goes way down the rabbit hole and then the responsive, and that's incredible. I mean, we talk about a win-win for them and just for, for teaching, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, for better or worse, um, I'm the guy that wants to break the application to see what its limits are. <laughs> so, you know, originally it was something like you'd only put four in a room and I said, I need eight and I need it now. Can you give me like a way to try that? And I just kept bugging them and finally it became eight. Then it became 16 people in a room and then it became okay, you could put 100 people in a video. And I said, that's great, but I have 180 people in my program. And so then they worked on that aspect and we got up to 140 and things wow. like that. So okay, well, I'm checking that out because, you know, it's it's every, people that are struggling with, with this. I mean, there's so many ways that people are struggling with this, you know, and if the, the advice is, you know, subscribe to Adobe Creative Cloud and learn how to use Premiere Pro and spend, you know, 180 hours putting your students and syncing everything up. If there's something that makes it easier than that, uh, and it sounds like this does that, um, that's that's amazing. There's a secondary area here, a secondary thing. Like, I'm somewhat doing this for selfish reasons, too. And here's why. Because in the spring, when we did try to do musical playing tests or exams and just check on their playing, that is a big time commitment. And you want to give everybody like a, a respectful amount of comments and all that. And that's just really hard to do. Some days you really just need to put them together, let them hear each other so they feel inspired. And you don't need to slap a grade on everybody individually. You just need to inspire. And so for me, I needed that hook. And I think this is that hook. Well, that's the challenge that pe people from the outside uh, looking in might not realize of having a program with, you know, 200 people in an orchestra. I remember back, I had 175 people at, at my old high school job at, at, its, at its height. And I remember thinking, okay, if I do a playing exam, that's 175 items, whether that's in-person time. And so it really made me think uh, of, of ways around that. And I tried to, I've always been a, a technology person and tried to find ways to, to uh, <laughs> solve the those problems but that's that's very cool that you've found that how much here's a question for you pre-pandemic how much tech fat how much did technology factor into your teaching like were you are you a person who's got the ipad up on the podium and you're you're uh doing airplay up on the monitor and you're sharing things in google classroom or are you more i guess we could say old school and staying away from that or like what how how did that work for you prior to this moment where we're doing tech all the time you know i i had just gotten to the point where i was collecting phones again because you know, just the whole idea you know, about two years ago, the whole idea of having this phone on you where you get these notifications and the, it's just like an anxiety device that sits there. And just having it, even if you turn the sound off, just knowing that they're getting all those notifications and you just get a little like buzz of whatever it is that's in their pocket, just feeling that on their presence, I think was just, uh, just really hurting students. So I started collecting them and yeah, they complained for a few days and they got over it. At that point, when they stopped complaining, it was like, oh, they're actually kind of listening more and they're just, they don't have that constant reminder. So yeah, so I was doing that, but in regards to my actual classroom, you know, I would usually start with music playing in the classroom. You know, I'd, I'd project uh, videos of performances and things that we've done, we've done um, you know, active response stuff there, but mostly I'm kind of in the weeds and I'm walking around the classroom doing things like that. You know, I've done Skype side by sides with other classes. I've done um, little recording projects here and there. You know, I, I do think it's important to market your program in a way that is nice for the community, particularly if you have an alumni base like I do. So, you know, I use technologies for kind of those types of things. Yeah, you're somebody that I think has has, has been particularly effective at marketing what you do in your program. And I, I, I gotta say back in 2013, 2014, I would use 
your videos to inspire my students because there's it's one thing to play a recording of the Berlin Philharmonic playing a piece. It's another thing for students to see people their exact same age, you know, couple states over uh, playing that repertoire. And I remember looking at my students' faces and they're like, oh, uh, it can be done like that. <laughs> so um, that w the, um, the, the phone thing, I remember back to teaching, I, I remember just feeling empathy for students when I would see them getting sucked into this addiction device you know it's like because because I, I know that feeling myself with with technology um, it's it's uh, it's a, it's such a tough thing I mean it's such a beautiful thing we're connecting like this because of this you know the technology we have but but that distraction device that constant buzzing in your students pockets it's it, it talk about getting you out of the moment well, there's other ways to look at that too, you know, are, should we instead be training them and using this technology properly because that is the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I tried that too. You know, I said, you know, I, I trust you guys with these devices. It just wasn't working for me. <laughs> so yeah. I was started collecting. And I don't know what's going to happen at the other end of this. We'll find out. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I mean, these are, again, let me throw some impossible questions at you, Jonathan. Sure. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so I, I was working on a project in, in the fall for beginner students because it's not a great time to be starting well, probably anything in the world, but especially like playing a musical instrument or a string instrument, you know, with, uh, and so y you can't, one can't help but think about the, the ripple effect that this has, even if it's just a year and a half and who knows how long that, you know, you take a year it, it, generally in, in, in music, particularly in strings, people don't start violin, viola, cello, bass later in life. It's not like uh, we choir, you know, not that this is totally uh, fair, but, but you know, you can kind of sort of have people start singing kind of at any point. That doesn't really work, especially for uh, your upper level orchestras. You know, you, you, you have a certain set of skills that, that you develop over the course of your education. So, uh, and again, sorry for the impossible question, but what, what are your thoughts on the ripple effect that we're gonna see in, in music education? And maybe some positives too, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna say something that may not be popular. But I am bracing myself to prepare for the rest of my career to be a completely different path that will involve flexibility, a different type of nurturing of the student, providing different opportunities, maybe more equitable experiences. Mm -hmm. I, I'm embracing for my, the rest of my career, not rebuilding, but kind of rethinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's important for teachers to know that uh, the, the, amount, the amount of colleagues I have that feel like they're failing their students right now. And a lot of students are dropping music because they, they kind of just are struggling in a virtual environment. You know, private teaching, you know, the private teachers in the area, I know some of them are losing a lot of students right now. And that's, that's hard to see, you know, because that's their livelihood as well. I, I think we need to really be cautious uh, moving forward about... Um, not trying to do the exact same thing when we come back, because I do think things are different. If you think about those fifth graders that were supposed to start this year, and they did, and amazing things are happening with fifth grade instrumental teachers. They're doing their best. I mean, this is so hard, but I'm seeing these really great things about virtual concerts and whatnot. But, you know, we really have to think about reteaching that curriculum in sixth grade, in which case the whole thing kind of ripples down. Um, and I, you know, I'm fully prepared to take my ensembles at the high school level and play slightly li easier literature for a few years, uh, definitely more diverse literature, just, just approaching it in a new, fresh way. And in some ways, that's a beautiful thing. So the ripple effect is, uh, it's going to be there. It's going to be strong. And I think teachers just need to uh, stay the course of what the values are of music education, get people to enjoy the experience get them to, you know, find a work ethic within it, within it um, and just find passion for it. And I think if we have some really passionate teachers going forward who are not bitter about losing this thing that used to be, I think we'll be in better shape. You know, I don't, I don't sense those accolades are, you know, that you listed about the first half of my career. Those are amazing achievements and I hang my hat on those, but I know I'm in for a completely different experience after this. And I, for one, am trying to embrace that. Well, and you're you're someone that I think of as somebody that that is has is so much more than those accolades and has been since they've been a teacher. And so even though you see those, you know, the trophies are there, the accolades are all there that we were talking about, but there's more to it. And you know, it, it, thinking about teaching 
is one of those professions, at least here in the United States, it's, it's one of those few professions where one might do it for 10, 20, 30 years in the same school. How rare that is in, our, in, our, in, in the world right now. And so it can be a profession that's slow to change, right? You're talking about what you did to, 10 years ago or what you did 15 years ago. And just because it's the way it's been done doesn't mean it's the way it has to be or the best way. And even thinking about those, those fifth graders, and it's so cool that people are, you know, this is an opportunity to try different things. So there are people doing great things out there. Um, but even if this, so this, the level that you might expect from someone coming into high school is likely to be different, uh, in, you know, as this ripple effect happens. But I think about some of the magnet schools in Chicago that have orchestra and talking to those orchestra teachers, they had a beginning strings class in ninth grade. And it was, it, they embraced it and it was awesome. And they, they because you just learn very differently at age 15 than you do. At, at, so just because it's, it's not the way it's been doesn't mean that it can't also be incredible so it's great to hear that you're uh you're sort of seeing seeing the future and uh are it sounds like you're uh, embracing it yeah i'm trying to one of the things i've done that i encourage all teachers to do really is if particularly programs like mine make a list of everything that was happening before the pandemic in your classroom just every event just take take it all and then um on one side write all the positives about it then write all the things that you think could improve based on um pandemic or not and then kind of look at it with another fresh eye, set of eyes what are those changes and how can they possibly impact your program so if you just kind of see it it's uh it's fascinating there are some things that i ferociously want to protect you know my my symphony orchestra being able to perform at hill auditorium my symphony orchestra being able to perform some concertos i think that's so valuable but then there are other things that I don't need to protect. There's some archaic ways in which the structure is set up. You know, the skills they learn in middle school should be the skills that you give them first in high school, right? But if your middle school teachers do something different, they're focusing on like a whole bunch of eclectic string stuff or composition. That's what their process should be coming in. And so you got to think about that stuff. And I do a lot of that eclectic stuff too, but not as much as I should. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, what have you done over the years in terms of eclectic styles and strings? I never know the term to use, but I know that you've been that you've been ex ex experimenting, whether that's the right word or not, or just just trying things that are not just your stock. And there's beauty, of course, playing concertos, playing full symphonic literature. How you know? I, I, hopefully, everybody will want to protect that, and and boy, will that be great to get back to once we get out, get through this. Like, I'll never take one of those experiences for granted again. But but I'm always thinking, and I know a teacher, we're, everybody in the teaching is string teaching profession is trying to think of a, a, a ways to get out of this kind of narrow box that that we've so frequently done you know, the, our craft. So what have you done over the years in terms of eclectic strings? Yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny. I've, I've wanted to do more and I've done what I think is enough in the past, but then I come across somebody like Christian House who inspires the heck out of me. And I call him this spring and I'm like, Christian, I don't know if this is the right time, but I think my students need you now. And so we started talking and then I'm looking at budgets and I'm looking at all things. I'm like, I just don't know if this is the right time, but at some point it's gonna happen. And so, um, but I, I'm hungry for that for my students because I know they like that stuff. And so anyway, what have I done? I've done my best to just to try to provide a variety of musical opportunity, period, whatever it is. You know, I've, I did this uh, thing called the T Tagore Project a few years ago uh, where we did some authentic uh, uh, music from India with the sitar. That was amazing. Um, I've done uh, several different units on you know, improvisation and, and blues and all that. And, you know, that's that's not enough to just do those things. You want to try to give them as authentic the experience as possible. But, um, you know, other things I'm really kind of hungry for right now are just kind of bringing more contemporary music into my program, period. At this exact moment, my symphony orchestra is studying the Cronus Quartet 50 for the Future series. And we're playing some of those on Zoom. Some of those were written for the Zoom platform. So why not do it? Uh, we just did a performance of Terry Riley's In C. Um, we're doing Threnody tomorrow uh, and recording that virtually. We're just kind of experimenting with um, extended techniques because those are some skills that they're going to need as performers in the future. So, you know, that's one thing that I've been doing. And um, 
you know, obviously trying to highlight uh, composers of color, um, female composers, all of these things, just so it becomes the norm in, in life. You know, when I look at like New World Symphony, you know, why do we always just play New World? You know, why can't we play Florence Price's Symphony Number no. One, or better yet? play one movement of each and open up that amazing dialogue. I think back to, I had a, a, a we called it jazz strings. Jazz was almost never played. <laughs> and it was one of those things that I never felt like I cracked the code on that one. But we we, we, we tried all sorts of, and I brought in my share of guest artists. And it was one, one of the moments that, that uh, s lingers with me in terms of my public school teaching career was when I took my students to Cuba. And I don't remember if we talked about this or not before, but, but I just, I, I, so, so I had about 60 students go. And I remember, uh, you know, the, the Cuban students wanted to jam with my students and my students, the look of horror in many of their eyes, you know, was, <laughs> was quite obvious. And I, I, I remember the, the, some of them saying, well, is there some music for me to read? Where's the music for me to read? And, and the Cuban students, what are you talking about? And so, but then some of the students, they stepped up and they were, they were uh, improving or trying to improv. And I just remember that was that of all of the trips that I did, that was the one that the students talked about the most and seemed to be the most meaningful. And I think that that, that made me really rethink so much about string teaching because all these Cuban students were getting up playing all these pieces I had never heard. All these funky rhythms and intricate pieces. And, and I just, it was so cool to see students the same exact age as the students I was there with from my school, you know, just having such a different experience and just, just a few miles from the United States, really. I mean, it's like hilariously close. So that, that was a moment that really has continued to stick with me to this day. Yeah, I think the more we do that, the better in every regard. I just, uh, mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, there's, there's, that's a big conversation about ways to blow up the curriculum to make it uh, more um, responsible and more inclusive. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, those conversations, I love being a part of them. And then I get deeper in the weeds with it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this project is monumental. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take the rest of my career to really, really figure out how I would do all that successfully. For sure. I just so admire that with, with uh, not to continually praise you about your program, but like with somebody who's in, in, a, in a, a position like you're like, which in, in the music education world, like the, the, you have what many, many would consider a dream job and situation. And it's certainly from the outside. But I, I, I just so admire that you've been on the forefront and thinking about uh, how we can, how we can, what we can do differently, how we can think differently about music education. And it's great to hear what you're doing during this pandemic and being shut away uh, with, with Upbeat and with, with everything else that we've been talking about. It's really cool. So just uh, thank you for doing the work you're doing. I think it's really exciting and you're, you're a great model for people to look at as somebody who has what you consider a, a thriving program by any standard and, you know, again, the accolades, the Grammy program, you know, accolades and the Midwest and everything. Um, but how cool that you're also with, uh, thinking beyond that. Yeah, you know what, though, Jason, all those years when I had those great programs for um, Grammy and Midwest and all that, it was hard to then come to those other orchestras that didn't get that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I was actively working really hard to try to give them experiences that are extremely meaningful. And you have to sometimes like create those from scratch and you got to put as much time into those as well. Otherwise, you know, what are you doing? It, it, you're, you know, feeding those tops, you know, 25% of your students is only part of the equation. You know, that's what I'm discovering during this pandemic too. I think um, we investing more time in the non-top ensembles in a different way is very important. And yeah, that's important. It's so important, and it's such a such a trap that I that certainly many educators I know, and probably me to an extent, fall into. It's like, oh, great, the middle orchestra, what a drag. Hey, assistant, you want to take it today? You know, and and but how to one one another moment that made me really kind of think about what we've been talking about here is I, my top orchestra at one of my jobs was right before my electronic music class. And it was so interesting to go from playing full, you know, Tchaikovsky five or whatever, and then go into 
into making dubstep in the room next door with a, t a none of those students were in orchestra and it was so fun to watch the confusion on the face of like my concert master who came in to ask me a question into dubstep class and I just remember thinking like what's going on in here is is just as interesting to these people as what's going on in there and it really made me that in particular big and particularly that juxtaposition of those two <laughs> those two musical experiences every day um, made me really think more broadly about what music education is. Yeah, if I didn't teach classes outside of orchestra, I would go crazy. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely needed it. One of my other positions is I, I, um, a lecturer in the history of music for humanities. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also taught guitar, I've taught music tech. Um, I was a co-teacher on a survey of African-American music class, which was really during my heart. That was a really fun class. And those are some of the, some of the best memories, memories I have as a teacher. So. Yeah. 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 I think it's so important to, and, and uh, again, the, a lot of people, their, their goal, or maybe what they think their goal is to exclusively teach their subject. Like if I can just teach band or just teach orchestra and get rid of that pesky guitar class or, or music tech class or what have you, you know, but, but I don't know for me having that a little bit of that mixture, at least uh, it, it spices things up, gets me thinking more broadly, gets me out of my rut. Oh, we have to. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. You, thank you so much for taking some time and hanging out with me. Is there anything else you want to get out from this Eastman thing? I could talk to you every single, and I, thank you so much with the young kids and everything you got going on. That's, I, I could talk to you every week and, and yeah. I, I, you know, I just want to be respectful of your time, obviously, but. <laughs> no, I, I mean, the only thing I'd say is, you know, we all, we all need to hang in there. We need to take care of each other right now. We need to share our great ideas. We need to let people, um, learn about the future of this industry at their own pace, but present tools to make it successful for people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as a teacher who I feel has done a lot of great things in the classroom, I am ready to embrace the fact that I need to start over in some ways mm -hmm. and go a step at a time and to return to normal may not be the right answer. And I hope some of you join me on that journey because I think that's an important one. Jonathan, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, learn more about Jonathan and everything's up to in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.